Hey guys, welcome to our first lecture of anatomy and physiology. This is the first lecture of a whole two-part series of lectures. Let's get started, shall we? Well, to get started, let's just talk about some definitions of what anatomy and physiology mean. Now, anatomy literally is the study of the structures of the human body. Now, literally, if you were actually to look at the Latin, tomi means to cut up or open. Makes sense, right? Because they used to do a lot of dissections to learn the parts of the body, and we still do. Now, notice I've put a picture of a scalpel here, but beware. When you take a lab class and you're doing dissections, lay off the scalpel already. Okay, the best dissection tools for dissecting an organism are your fingers, your digits. That is the best thing. You want blunt tools mostly. Uh, there are blunt probes. If you have to use a scalpel or some scissors, usually it's just to make those initial cuts, and then, uh, and then after that you can take blunt instruments, especially your fingers, and kind of rip and move around. Works so much better. Keep that in mind when you're doing lab. But anatomy, study of the structures of organisms. So the names of the bones, the names of the muscles and the blood vessels and how these things uh, relate to one another. Physiology is the study of the biological functions. In other words, how those structures function, often at a cellular level or a subcellular level. So the normal functions of cells, tissues, organs, systems, it's an emphasis on the mechanisms. Now, how does this play into what you're going to be learning? Let's take an example of the difference between anatomy and physiology. Let's take an example of your bicep, right? That's a muscle. The anatomy part of that is studying, okay, this is called the bicep. You know, where's the insertion? Where's the origin? That's the anatomy part. How that muscle actually functions, what, for example, is going on at the cellu cellular level? And you take a look at how the nervous system interacts with the muscular system, how a neuron, a, a nerve cell, will actually go and meet up very close to the muscle and that the space between them, the synaptic cleft, will receive uh, chemicals from little bubbles called vesicles, and those chemicals will cause uh, electrical changes in the muscle, which ultimately results in contraction. So anyway, that's just a sneak preview of some of the stuff to come here, but that's the physiology. What's going on at the cellular level? How are chemicals involved? Things like that. Now, of course, you can't have function without structure. So the function of parts of the body follow the structures that they're based on. Okay, now let's take a whole organism, right? I'm a whole organism, you're a whole organism, and what we see with our eyes are just, you know, a body, a head, a, a torso, some limbs, but what's really cool is in this class we'll actually go and learn what makes all of these seemingly simple parts work and what, what makes them up. So we're going to go from the macroscopic level to the microscopic level and beyond. So for example, Let's take this person here. This is uh, Jenny. She's a Barbie wannabe. Now, of course, Jenny is made out of plastic, but let's pretend for a minute that she's a real person. Now, you see her from the organism level here. So let's, uh, let's actually go backwards here. So that's the organism level. Now let's zoom in on her and find out what makes that organism work. Well, if you were to cut her open, you would realize that this organism is made up of a set of systems, um, a system that include different organs working together. So for example, she has a nervous system that includes her nerve cells, includes her brain and her spinal cord, and as we mentioned previously, that nervous system interacts with other systems of her body like the muscular system. So how she's able to bend her leg or kick her leg is because of the messages she's receiving from her nervous system etc. How she's able to beat her heart, well, she has to have oxygen to do it, so that's dependent on the respiratory system, etc. So we'll be making these ties between different organ systems um, throughout the course. Now, those organ systems are made up of the organs themselves. So let's just recap a sec. So here's a cute little organism. She's made up of systems of organs interacting with each other. This is her digestive system, which includes the small intestine, the large intestine, the liver, et cetera, stomach. And so if you now take any one of those organ systems and look at a particular organ in it, like here's the stomach, you'll see that the stomach itself is made up of things. Now those things that the 
organ is made of are a collection of cells called tissues. So here is the tissue level, and you can see it's made up of individual cellular component cells. And here's a nucleus for each one of those cells. So the tissue level is made up of cells. Now, this is where it gets freaky. Those cells are made up of molecules. Now, you've probably heard of molecules, right? Molecules like water is a molecule. Carbon dioxide that we breathe out is a molecule. Our cells are nothing but molecules put in different combinations and working together. How cool is that? And what's even cooler than that is those molecules are made up of atoms of the periodic table of elements. And we'll spend a whole lecture this unit on chemistry and looking at the periodic table and what exactly atoms are. Just a sneak preview, atoms are the basic unit of matter. They, they can't be split and still have the same properties. So, so let's go back down the list here. So now going from smallest to largest, atoms come together to make molecules. Molecules come together to make up the cells. And these cells come together to make up the tissues, which make up our organs, which collectively become organ systems to make the whole organism. Fascinating. I mean, you can think of us as really just a bunch of atoms walking around. It's kind of deep, isn't it? All right. That being said, uh, we are going to, in this class and in your lab, we are going to be exploring things from, as I said, the microscopic level to the macroscopic level. Now, in anatomy and physiology, the field of study that deals with microscopic parts of the body is called histology. So you'll, see, you'll hear me use that term a lot. Histology is the study of tissues. So for example, I have some pictures of some different tissues here. So um, for example, here's some epithelium of, uh, of the digestive system, et cetera. So this may look just kind of pretty, like you could put it on your wall, but you actually are going to get really good at histology. And the goal is to be able to give you a slide of some tissue, and you would know what part of the body that tissue was from. In fact, you could take whole courses just on histology. We're going to kind of do the basics here, but you're going to, you're going to do a lot of histology in this course, and it's awesome. But keep that hierarchy of organisms in mind. You know, what, what makes us up? Because ultimately, if you're going to have things function at the organism level, they better be functioning right at the cellular level. Things go wrong at the cellular level, that equals bad. Okay, so that's microscopic anatomy. Gross anatomy... Now, we're not talking about when you dissect and the juices start flowing and it's really gross. What we mean here, it's not gross, it's beautiful. But what we mean by gross anatomy is the study of the macroscopic structures. So, for example, I have here a dissected heart. It's awesome. And it's a preserved heart, of course. Now, the whole heart here and the study of just the, the structures. So, for example, you might learn these little stringy things or your heart strings. They're called the chordae tendini or et cetera, et cetera. This is a ventricle. So those names of those structures are, that's gross anatomy because I'm looking at the big stuff. If I were to go and take a tissue sample from the heart and look at it under the microscope, that is histology. So I think you, you understand the difference, right? Okay, so let's just talk about all the main organ systems of the body because we're going to be studying these in the anatomy and physiology series. In this first half of the series, we're going to tackle some of those organ systems, and in the second half, we'll be ta tackling the other organ systems, but that's a different course. So um, organ systems are groups of organs with related functions so that they, these organs work together for kind of a common purpose. So I've kind of listed them all here, and I'll show you pictures on the next slide. But for example, uh, one of the lectures will deal with the integumentary system. So this is your skin and your hair and your nails. And we'll talk in that lecture about the functions of the integumentary system and what makes it up. But in general, obviously, your skin is there to protect you and kind of hold it all together. And also, if you, you, know, if you get hot, you start sweating, et cetera, et cetera. So these have protective roles. Uh, we'll be going over the nervous, endocrine, um, skeletal, muscular, circulatory, immune, respiratory, urinary, digestive, and reproductive, this series. But in this particular course, we'll be going over the integumentary system, the skeletal system, the muscular, the circulatory, also known as cardiovascular, the respiratory, and the digestive.
and I don't think I left anything out. I think that's everything in addition to obviously today we're going over just orientation to the body and we'll be doing some chemistry and basic cellular biology as well. So how do you remember these 11 organ systems of the body? Well, there's a study trick here. Run Mrs. Lydic. Okay, so let's see if we can break this down. So I have all 11 systems in pretty gnarly pictures right here. So uh, notice there are two R's. One R is for respiratory, which we'll be studying in this course. Uh, U is for urinary, which is right here. So that's your bladder and your kidneys. Obviously your respiratory was your lungs and the associated parts. N is for nervous system, which is right here. So it's your brain, spinal cord, and, and the neurons, the nerves. Um, M is for muscular. There's a nice muscular guy right there. R, we're going to say the second R is for the reproductive system. So this includes female or male parts. Um, S is going to be for the skeletal system, which I don't actually have on the slide here, but skeletal system, everybody knows what a skeleton looks like. L is for lymphatic system. This is your, really your immune system here, or what's related to your immune system. So these are like your uh, lymph nodes and your spleen and things like that. Uh, I, in this case, is for integumentary. So we just mentioned that. D is obviously for digestive system. E is for endocrine system, which is your, basically the organs related to your hormones. And C would be cardiovascular, which is your heart and your blood vessels, or your, you could call it the circulatory system. Okay, so those are the 11 organ systems of A and P. All right, now, have you noticed that we seem to always be working? You know, you go to sleep, you get back up, you do your thing, you go back to sleep. We kind of have this cycle. Well, in both wake and sleep, our bodies are doing way more work than we think. They're constantly doing things, measuring, you know, assessing, is this right or not, fixing the problems that are there. In other words, our bodies are trying to maintain a balance, and that balance is called homeostasis. And this is really the basis of the physiology you'll be learning in AMP. Homeo means same, and stasis refers to status. So same status, homeostasis. This is trying to maintain constancy of the internal environment. Um, and anytime our bodies deviate too much from that balance, from that homeostasis, we're sick. We have disease. That's really what disease is, is deviation from homeostasis, getting away from that balance. So um, how does this work? Well, it actually happens in two ways. So let's take an example. Let's say, um, you know, if you're outside, it's really hot. If it's really hot, what do our bodies do? Oh, well, they start to sweat, right? So you sweat, and that's the body's cooling mechanism. Of course, if you're a dog, you pant. So same kind of thing. But we sweat, that helps to cool us down. Now, if you get cold, what do you do? You start shivering. So your muscles start actually quivering, and that helps generate heat. So it helps to warm you up. Or you could just snuggle with your stuffed animal or your loved one, right? So, um... So we actually have ways of measuring what our state of being is inside our body for many, many different things. I'm giving temperature as one example, but it's everything from hormones to blood sugar levels to, I mean, you just name it. Everything our bodies do is about maintaining homeostasis, pH, et cetera. So this really happens in two ways. We have what are called negative feedback loops, and we have what are called positive feedback loops. So in negative feedback loops, it's kind of like the example I gave with the temperature. Or let's take an analogy. Imagine in your house, um, maybe you live in an area where you actually need air conditioning and heating. If you live in Hawaii, that's probably not the case. But in many places of the world, they need a heater and an air conditioner. And to control that heater and air conditioner, you need a thermostat, right? And let's say you set your thermostat to a particular temperature. Maybe you set it to... 70 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? Well, that thermostat is constantly reading what the temperature in the room is. If it goes above 70 degrees Fahrenheit, it says, okay, it's too hot in here. Bam, kick on the air conditioning to bring it back down to 70 degrees, the set point. If it gets cold and the temperature in the room drops below 70 degrees, well, thermostat says, uh-uh, too cold in here, kick on the heater, 
until you bring it back up to 70. So it's kind of like you're always like this, but you're trying to maintain a constancy as close as possible. And that's what our bodies do. So yes, we have internal thermostats um, in the form of certain structures in our brain and uh, hormones associated with them that will determine what the temperature is in our body. If it gets too far above 37 degrees Celsius, then, uh, then it's going to kick in mechanisms like sweating to bring it dip back down to 37. And if it gets too far below 37 degrees Celsius, then you'll have shivering and other mechanisms to bring it back up to 37 degrees Celsius, which would be our set point. Okay, so um, that's negative feedback mechanisms, and there's a million of them here. You think of blood sugar level. You know, if the blood sugar gets too high, you're going to put out more insulin. If it gets too low, you're going to put out another hormone to help um, try to store some of that sugar or um, have some release. So depending on what it is that you're talking about, different negative feedback mechanisms will kick in. Now, there's also what are called positive feedback loops. And a positive feedback loop is where it's good to have too much of a good thing. So for example, uh, let's think of a woman in labor. So when a woman goes into labor, her uterus um, starts to contract, the muscles of the uterus contract, and that actually causes more of the hormone that caused it to contract in the first place, oxytocin, to be released. So the uterus will send signals through the nervous system back to the brain that says, okay, we've started contracting, now we're gonna need more oxytocin. So more oxytocin gets released, causes more contractions, and then she's in further pain, right? And more and more and more. And so you keep getting stronger and stronger contractions because of more and more release of that hormone until the baby's born, and then you switch to a negative feedback mechanism which stops the oxytocin from being produced. One final note about homeostasis with regards to temperature, and that is that different kinds of organisms maintain their homeotic temperature in different ways. So we have endotherms versus ectotherms. Endotherms are all mammals, like this cute cuddly chipmunk or the dolphin, all birds, like that cute little guy back there, and even a few fish. So you're an endotherm, I'm an endotherm, that chipmunk's an endotherm, all mammals, all birds, and some fish. Uh, ectotherm is the opposite of an endotherm. Ecto means outside. So ectotherms uh, include all the invertebrates, like this mollusk snail here or the insects, as well as some vertebrates. For example, the reptiles like that snake. So an endotherm is warm-blooded, and that means that an endotherm can maintain their temperature homeostasis internally. So they have internal mechanisms, their metabolism, um, for example, in humans, if we get too hot, we sweat, or if we get too cold, we shiver. So we have mechanisms to maintain our temperature internally. As opposed to an ectotherm, like that snake, they have to rely on the outside environment to maintain their internal temperature. Uh, for example, a reptile like a snake, if he gets cold, he's going to have to go out into the sun to warm up. And if he's hot, he's going to go into the shade to cool down. So he has to have an environmental condition to maintain that temperature. We endotherms, we can do it all on our own internally. All right, see you next time.